Hello and welcome once again to another lecture in Readings in Philippine History. For this lecture, we are going to tackle the important topic of land and the export economy in the Philippines during the colonial Spanish period, or rather the Spanish colonial period. Now, to begin with, there are various uses for land. Um, this is not just something that is stuck in time, but rather this is something that is perennial or continuously occurring, especially in the in the modern in the modern day, you no, know, in contemporary times. So, land as a, as a valuable capital, as a valuable um, not only resource base, but as a valuable form of we can say commodity has been has been around uh, since well since basically property rights have been invented by people to keep their land in the hands of their um of their persons and of their inherit uh, and of their um, descendants as well so land is very crucial in the discussion on philippine history as it is a timeless question and perhaps we can say forms the basis of politics and how society works in the country at large uh, but also we have to remember that land as a, as a topic in itself is very contentious you no know, it is the it is um, the source of many conflicts and uh, it also creates um, tensions however looking at land as a capital gives us a sense of of understanding Philippine history through the lens of, um, let's say, material conditions. And because this is about material conditions, the different uses of land as livelihood, food source, uh, in general, source of wealth, uh, clearly, it clearly gives us a picture of how, how power dynamics or how power politics occurred in the country, who has the power, and more importantly, how those powers are exercised and to what end so we will talk about land as a capi as a as a form of capital in this lecture all right so in this part of the lecture we're going to talk about land in the form of um, land as a means of sustenance no so we're going to talk about land from the perspective of subsistence. So what is subsistence? This is basically um, farmers or families or communities uh, growing crops to sustain themselves. Now, uh, as human beings, of course, we need food sources and um, settled agriculture or farming, no, agri um, agriculture itself is, um, is the basis of the so-called uh, sustenance no, of uh, of the human being of of human beings in general so looking at land from the perspective of subsistence we we tend to view its productivity not from the perspective or not from the the viewpoint of profit but to produce enough to feed people to keep them healthy and to sustain the society and to sustain the community in general so before the 1800s no before the 19th century families in rural areas they grew vegetables and rice for their own consumption rather than uh, producing these crops uh, to be sold in um, in local markets and later on in international markets so subsistence was the main means of production in terms of agriculture during that time so you might be wondering but don't they export their crops for profit to, to reap the benefits of, let's say, of, of rich agricultural land. Um, you have to remember that in the context of the early Spanish period, uh, in the Philippines in particular, what they were interested in, especially in the country, no? they were interested in making use of the Philippines as a form of platform to, to basically catapult themselves into the into the Chinese trade that is prospering in Macau and to partake in that trade. It was so profitable at the time that many Spaniards did not really did not really interest themselves in agriculture yet. No, unlike in Latin America, they early on um, 
they early on gained much interest, economic interest in agriculture, especially uh, not only in not only in planting in planting uh, crops, but they were interested at least in Latin America in ranching. No, so they created um, they created or they rather they exploited the vast grasslands of that continent to grow cattle, no, to grow cows. Um, in the Philippines, there is recorded um there is recorded efforts no there are recorded archives that says that there are parts of the philippines that became famous for ranching but most of the time or for the most part during much of the spanish colonial period subsistence was the form of of farming no? to to support the community rather than to sold their products um into into let's say international markets so there's a difference between cash crops which we will know later on and subsistence economy at that time which was rather to which was aimed at producing uh for local consumption so what occurred during the during the later period of the spanish colonial era going into let's say um the 1800s now um there was there was largely um there was largely a major shift in the way we conduct agriculture in the in the philippines at that time and that is um there is a major turnover in agrarian holdings so those who held land before those who owned land before they were gradually losing these um these traditional holdings that they had that they had inherited from from previous generations because of several factors one of the crucial factors is population growth so by the time that the reductiones and the towns were established throughout much of the philippines that replicated the spanish way of life um there was already for 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 centuries and decades even um, there was already um, a growing trend of population growth so you have to remember that when the spanish first came to the philippines what they found was um was rather an archipelago with desperate different with different communities that were scattered based on the based on the barangay form of um communities that were prevalent at that time so in this way, once the Spanish, once they had concentrated the local population into, uh, into literally into towns no, so that are based around um, local churches. No, remember the concept of uh, bajo de la campana. So they were literally within earshot or within hearing distance of um, the the church bells. And once the once the population was largely Christianized. And they were concentrated in in um, in land holdings first in haciendas and later on in, around the towns. No, so once they were they were there, population growth was inevitable because people were already reaping certain benefits from the from the uh, from the Spanish way of of governance. No, and that one of the benefits that they enjoyed was largely there was. At least, not at least for the time being, or for most of the time during that time, there was food security. And once they had food security, and of course, the security of, um, let's say, knowing that there won't be any more mangayaus, or there won't be major raids like before the Spanish, the Spanish era, um, population growth was inevitable. So the population grew, and as a result, because of this population growth, um, there was also subdivision of family farm plots. This is because of um, not only inheritance uh, arrangements, but also the practical need of um, subdividing plots so that families can sustain themselves. And of course, with the, with the rising number of, of families, no? and of course, with the rising number of um, inheritors, of original of properties that were originally passed on by by um, by previous generations so you can see here um that um that the plots of land that were huge that were massive during the during the first generations that acquired them 
later on these lands had to be subdivided into smaller lots to, accom to accommodate the inheritors of those lands. And this created a system wherein um, smaller land holdings in the, in the subsistence economy at that time um, they were they were gradually less productive than their than the than the than the lands that were held by the previous generations, and there were major shifts as well in in the form of agriculture, no, and be, and that is primarily because of the economy of the Philippines modernizing. So eventually, once the galleon trade became more and more of a liability rather than an asset for the Spanish Empire. Um, Spanish administrators in the island, most notably Governor um, Basco, no? Jose I. Basco, um, he decided to he decided to pursue different schemes of making making the Philippines um, commercially viable, so that the colony can sustain itself and not just rely on the basis of of the of the then obsolescence of the galleon trade. And because of this modernizing economy, we see the rise of major industries, and these industries are duly noted, no, by by um, even by popular culture at that time, and that and even until today, you no, know, reference referring to Nolimi Tanghere, um, we are seeing, for example, at least in the, at least going into the eighteen hundreds and well into the eighteen hundreds, we are seeing the the. The rise of monopolies like monopoly on tobacco, and there's also the the monopoly on opium that the colonial government had, and they were also creating other industries like hemp, for example, which is very vital. You no, know, the, the the planting of hemp and the and the processing of hemp into various products like rope and um, other commodities of daily life, and so the modernizing economy meant that um, agricultural land and its uses was or is rather changing and because of these changes there is um, a loss and there is also the accumulation of land on the part of many families so land holdings agrarian holdings as again as i said as a capital is undergoing massive changes during the spanish period uh, by, especially by the time of the 1800s when the when the galleon trade was no longer was no longer um valuable as it was previously um the land the land economy or rather the the agrarian economy of the philippines changed as well because of these efforts to gradually commercialize um land and to make its um use more profitable than subsistence and so with um with the gradual transition from subsistence economy to a commercial economy we have to ask who benefited from this transition and more importantly why have they benefited from this transition well first off we have two categories of beneficiaries of the gradual turnover of agrarian holdings the first ones are the principalia these are the rather the, the so-called elite of Philippine society. Usually they are professionals and uh, many of their children as a result of, of the turnover of agrarian holdings and the profit and the profitability of said agrarian holdings in the pursuit of cash crops. Gradually their children became um, middle class and some of them even went on to became to become the, the elite of these middle class um Filipinos at that time they were the they were the um, ilustrados. No, Rizal came from such a background himself, wherein his families were considered as inquilinos or or um, let's say tenants of the friars uh, in the in their in their hometown of Calamba. No, and and because of that, um, these elites who largely rented and some of them actually owned their large land holdings. They, they became rich of the cultivation of cash crops and this generate uh, this um, this valuable capital that generated them wealth has also granted them certain privileges in society primarily in economic power 
However, this economic power did not translate into political power due to severe limitations set by the ruling Spanish um, by the ruling Spanish administrators of the country at that time, no, and of course with the help of the friars as well, who were um, hand in hand with colonial administration, and because of that limitation on their political power, later on we will see that these principalia were actually the prime they were actually the the, the prime supporters of the revolution no? of the of the eighteen ninety six Katipunan revolution. And um, they were also the ones who agitated for decades for major changes in the way that they are treated as, um, as part of Philippine society. So the limitation that is set upon them, the political limitations, became a point of friction, a point of contention by these principalia who had acquired land holdings and now want recognition as, um, as a part of their trappings of power at that time. Then on the opposite end, you have the establishment, which is represented largely by the friars. So the friars by this time already had large last ho uh, land holdings in the form of haciendas. How did they came to acquire such large land holdings? Um, in the early days of the Spanish colonization, and this, this persisted throughout much of the Spanish era, there were people who upon their death had actually left their property, um, their, their land, to the church. And the church had made use of these lands to, um, to increase their land holdings. And later on, they found that um, it is profitable for them to, um, to rent out these land holdings to different people so that the land will not lay fallow, so that the land will be productive. No? So, um, for the most part, the friars rented out their lands and they created this um, system of, of uh, let's say, of, of agribusiness, if we call it in modern, in, in modern parlance nowadays. They created this system of, of um, profitable agriculture you know, and which suited well the, which suited well the, um, the transition into cash crops at that time. And you have to remember that the transition into cash crops would not be complete without the opening of the Philippines to international trade. So cash crops like hemp, cash crops like tobacco, and many others, no opium, um, they became profitable because they are now sold into foreign markets rather than sold into, um, let's say, rather than sold into domestic markets. Take note. That the rise of the span, uh, that the rise of the sugar barons of Negros came around this time, and it also came at the expense of um, of major urban centers. No, at that at that at that period, most notably at the expense of Iloilo, because with the opening of the Philippines into international trade, there was also the 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 flooding of certain goods into the Philippine market, most notably cheap British textiles. No? So you can read about that in the, in, um, in the article that I'm going to give you on, uh, on Iloilo. No? So in this, in this setting of turnover of agri agrarian holdings, there are beneficiaries, and we have met the Principalia and the Friars as the main beneficiaries of this um, phenomenon of transitioning into cash crops. And there are losers as well, no? um, not just the weavers of Iloilo who actually lost um, much of their, their trade and their craft due to cheap British texti textiles once the economy was opening up to, um, to, foreign, to foreign trade. So there, there, are, there, are, there are consequences on, uh, there are consequences um, in regards to agrarian holdings you no know, gradually transitioning to um, a cash crop dominated um, export economy all right so actually you can read more about this um, this section of the this of the lecture on page 75 of the book states state and society in the Philippines by Patricio Abinales and his wife Amoroso no? so um 
uh, in this regard, uh, I, I suggest you would read on this one, but I'll, I'll discuss briefly on on what happened or what are the, the triggering points that actually led to the Philippines during the colonial during the later colonial period of the Spanish era. Um, why did the Philippines transition into an export economy, especially in terms of agriculture? So from subsistence to export economy. Well, um, first of all, we have to remember that by the time of the 1800s, the Spanish Empire was already in decline. Um, we have to take note, for example, that uh, that um, during the 1800s, Spain, uh, Spain's empire was greatly reduced during the wars of independence by its Latin American colonies. So first, Mexico broke, broke off, then later, uh, much of Latin America um, bro broke away from Spain, no? um, especially led by by um, by Simon Simeon Bolivar, Bolivar uh, celebrated today as the as a as a as a very pivotal figure in Latin America. So you can you can check out his biography on YouTube or any other channel that you might want to 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 research about. So what was happening is that events from from literally a, a world away from an, an ocean away was shaping the 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 was shaping how the philippines the philippine economy was um, was transitioning no so with the decline of the spanish empire there was there was the need to have less and less reliance on on basically on on spanish um, subsidies into into the philippines no so without one without um Without that, without economic viability, without commercial viability, the Philippines cannot stand on its own. And we have seen that at least in the part in the 1700s, no, um, about 50 or so years, a few dec um, a few decades before before the 1800s, we have seen the we have seen the the Seven Years' War spill over into the Spanish Empire, most notably into the Philippines wherein um, the British actually took the capital of Manila and occupied it for, for um, a, few, a few months to, to a few years. And this also coincided with the revolt of Diego Silang and later on of Gabriela Silang. And so the Spanish Empire, and, and from the perspective of its administrators in the Philippines, they saw that they need to help themselves to make the, the Philippine colony viable. Otherwise, um, Spain would lose uh, this colony too, if not in, if not, um, if not on the, on the inevitability, on the inevitability of revolts, then um, perhaps Spain would have lost the, would have lost the Philippine colony to other uh, colonial powers that were interested in taking up the Philippines and its valuable geopolitical or geostrategic location on the map. Then the galleon trade also ended, and because the galleon trade ended, um, the, ma the, the primary reason why the Philippines was retained as a colony also evaporated no, with the galleon trade. Because again, the Philippines was originally envisioned as a main platform or a main stop in the Trans-Pacific route of the galleon trade. So that there's that also, and the galleon trade, although it brought profit for for some in the Philippines, huge profits. Uh, it was not really, it was not really something that made the colony um, viable. It didn't make the colony economically sound, so to speak. Then you also have the rise of British free trade policies that benefited much from the opening of the Philippine colony. So, if you remember in the previous uh, in the previous slide, I talk about. Um, how Brit cheap British textiles actually put out, um, they actually put out uh, Iloilo's thriving weaving economy at that time. No? So that's, there's that. So free trade policies or the, or the, um, the massive input of British trade uh, also shifted the way that our economy was running to an export economy. No? So, 
aside from importing British goods, uh, we had to we had to export um, Filipino goods no, uh, during that time, so that we can we can um, offset you know, this this rise of uh, British goods around the world around the world you no know, in massive quantities. Uh, you have to remember as well that um, the British were able to export um, cheap goods around the world because they were they were the first economy to actually transition into the revo into the industrial revolution they were the they were the first to industrialize uh, via steam engines and other and other um and other technological advances so there's that as well and the spanish were never able to to compete with that no so they had to play catch up with the british then there's the loss of the Spanish American colonies, which I discussed earlier um, around the point of uh, the decline of the Spanish Empire. Okay, so how can land be actually acquired? There's this concept of Pacto de Retrovenda. Um, we can we can call this uh, or we can we can summarize this very briefly. Uh, this this concept of Pacto re, re Pacto de retroventa is basically a resale of land. No, so um, there are there are loans taken out during hard times, wherein ang land is to put it to put it simply giprinda ang land, no? where land is um, is sold so that farmers can they can actually take out loans, for example. But then um, when those loans are not repaid then um then those who have loaned the money they can take away the land as a form of compensation on their part no since they uh since um the the lender needs need also to make ends meet and so this accumulation of land was due to to um to massive loans on to farmers who ha who are not able to who are not able to repay those loans either through either because there is a, let's say uh, there are natural phenomenon that have rendered them unable to pay like storms for example or calamities or they are just not able to to pay the the lenders because of uh, massive rates of of um, let's say of of those loans then there's also the case of land grabbing, which is Pacto de Retrovenda is actually, um, if you if you look at it closely, it can also be considered as a form of land grabbing by a loan sharks. No, so there, there's that aspect of it, although that's very contentious. So you can also read about land grabbing, and this is um, there's a contentious claim here by Abinales and Amoroso that it is often done by religious orders. So there's that no so I, I do not wish to to delve into that territory that much i would rather have the authors themselves discuss it to you so you can read it on page 81 the the, uh, the sources are are actually attached to the module so you can you can explore that further for yourselves so this is how um friar estates or haciendas at that time this is how they actually work no, so also I'm representing it to you in the form of cogs, and as we all know, if one cog turns, the others also turn. So we can see here, for example, that um the the smallest cogs of this um elaborate system are the tenant laborers. No, so the tenant laborers again they were they were part of um they are part of the massive estate. They are given out parcels of land. Uh, to be cultivated and they are they are usually um part of the rented land or owned land or rather sorry since this is the fire estate they are they are part of the rented land of the inquilinos the principalias who rented out land so the lands that they rent they also parcel it to to cultivators because you have to remember the principalia they do not really farm themselves but rather they they um, take advantage of the labor of the cultivators, the tenant laborers. No, so these these cultivators they cultivate the cash crops, and then they give out um, a huge part of their earnings to their to the principalia 
and the principalia also um, give the lion's share of their profit to the the owners of the land who are the friar the friars themselves the religious orders at that time so as you can see in this system of cultivate of um of cultivators principalia and the friars there is some sort of a resemblance of a feudal system of manorship no so there's a feudal feudal system of of sharing crops per se or sorry not sharing crops but sharing the profit of crops and uh and this led to later on this led to um severe tensions wherein ordinary cultivators and ordinary people themselves have given the friars a bad name and um, again there was there was um leading up to 1896 revolution there were certain there were certain um, if there were certain let's say confrontations that happened and of course it it all the the lid, the lid of it all came off in the 1896 revolution where in the friars were targeted by 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 katipuneros because of their excesses and many of those excesses occurred within the within the setting of the friar estate at that time so they not only they they do not only held economic power but uh, they do not only held sorry they do not only held religious and political power but also economic power as well as a bedrock of that uh, of their um, massive influence over philippine society another layer of um, of wealth distribution by by uh, let's say in the, in this system of of cash crops no of exporting cash crops uh, we have we have we have these three key players that are uh, that are basically the, the the holders of the lion's share of the of the wealth generated by cash crops so the principalia well, uh, reap the harvest of the cash crops then the friars also gain much of the wealth of coming from the principalia's um, ventures and then the government they too also um, also have created monopolies to actually take advantage of these agricultural exports so as you can see um, in this system of wealth generation via the cash crops no we can see that um, that Philippine society reflects now very much what was stated by by Rizal in his novels where in Philippine society is actually well it's in terms of its wealth no and of course of social status that comes along with wealth it became um, the, the the wealth became concentrated on a very few number of people and these few number of people they 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 not only benefited from the cash crop economy but they want to keep it going no and later on the cash crop economy um the it became a, such a staple of philippine life that well after the colonial period or no, the spanish colonial period much of this system stayed in place during the american period and later on after world war ii it still prevailed around much of the colony or around sorry around much of the philippines at that time so another reason why um why there was a transition into into the export economy and its many other effects as well so another reason was that during the during much of the spanish era land was not formerly or was not properly uh, let's say it was not systematically assessed in the sense that there was no property rights or rather there is very limited property rights to these lands you have to remember that by the start of the Spanish period, no, going all the way back to the conquest period of, of the Spanish colonization, lands were granted in the form of, of um, haciendas, no, of encomiendas at first and then later as haciendas. No? So the difference is that encomiendas were granted to the original conquistadores, the, the soldiers who came to the Philippines to... To, um, to colonize the, the 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 area so they were granted um they were granted uh land and of course the people and the resources within those lands by the spanish crown by the by the spanish king himself 
And um, these these lands later on were passed down to their to their successors or to their inheritors or was given to the church, etc. etc. But um beyond that one, um there is no systemic issuance of land titles. And this is a problem that uh that many that many families encountered, no, especially with with the parceling of lands and many of many of those lands were lost to land grabbers primarily again because of this problem that there is no systemic issuance of land titles this also has roots in particular with the way that language the language of the law is being used uh, is used in the country you have to remember that there is a disparity between between ordinary people and of course those who are considered as principalia no those who are elites in the sense that Spanish, although it was considered to be largely taught, it never really gained hold around much of the population. So Spanish as a language was used as um, as an indicator of status and wealth at that time. And this indicator of status and wealth, it also became um, it also became a hindrance for ordinary people to actually acquire land titles because if you cannot speak the language then there's uh, certainly there's certainly a barrier as to what kind of information that people can get in terms of how they can transact how they can um, how how they, how they can make use of the law and is and if you can see this um there are certain let's say there are certain parallels with the way that that we use english um at this time in studying law no? so there's there's still that continuation of of barriers being put or there we can say there is a form of gatekeeping by the elites in terms of how how property can be acquired no? so there's that aspect as well and this is very interesting for us because many of the problems that are persistent or that that persist today they have roots during the spanish colonial era and they still bother us a lot until the um it still bothers us a lot today. So the consequences of the lack of systemic issuance of land owners uh, of land titles and consequently land ownership are the following. So the colonial government is not able to tax land and the produce of land. Although curiously, they, they promoted cash crops and perhaps they, ta I, I don't know the full details of this. I think I have to research more. Um, they 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 did not tax land per se but rather perhaps they tax the 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 trade around cash crops no? so import export for example so there is little land improvement in the se in the sense that abinalis and amoroso um states that the lack of land titles remove any incentive to invest in land improvement um this is also a very uh, a very poignant point, no, a very important point, wherein um, this this piece of advice, or rather this this statement by Abinales and Amoroso, is actually corroborated by um, by Darun Asimoglu and James R. Robinson in their book Why Nations Fail, no, because um, for them the lack of property rights is actually an indicator of why nations were not able to. Uh, or why certain countries are not able to develop properly and it is still a phenomenon today so it's quite timeless no kaning land as um as a form of capital so it's a it's a there are many issues that are timeless so head tax or the tribute system was favored over property or income tax because of number one government the colonial government was not able to tax land transactions and the produce of those lands no but they were able to tax the trade around cash crops so peasants are heavily taxed compared to the principalia yeah. so this is the thing no the the head count applied to the peasants the principalia yeah, dating all the way back to the conquest period they had certain privileges that exempts them from the tributo or the or the head tax per se okay 
So this is the end of the lecture and I hope you also find the following terms in the material that is provided to you. So um, you, you read more into these, for example. Um, I wasn't able to discuss the Suez Canal, but um, it's very important uh, in, a, in a way because the Suez Canal is a major conduit for for trade and later on for for the pursuits of a certain Dr. Jose Rizal or sorry of a certain Jose Rizal no so so in the in the way the Suez Canal is an important piece of infrastructure that that is um, critical for understanding Philippine history and how it developed or and how it um, shaped no the Philippine history so there's that as well so I hope you read more about um, export economy cash crops. There are certain there are certain um, there are certain surprises along the way that you will that you would have noticed that have parallels with 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 what we are experiencing today in contemporary society. And so with that, I hope we can can we can um, or I hope that I have contributed much to your knowledge on Philippine history around the importance of land. So thank you for listening to this lecture and I will catch you on the next one.